Welcome everybody to the third ARCI video Zoom meeting. This is a, uh, we're getting the ball rolling here and having some good meetings and, and this is our third one. So we're still on the learning curve. Um, today we've got a pretty uh, nice set of presentations lined up. I wish we had another one. We have an open slot that we couldn't fill, but you can see in front of you, in front of you right there on the screen that uh, We've got some uh, presentations lined up. I will remind you that this meeting is being recorded. Um, we still haven't figured out how we're going to share those recordings. We, we have some work to do with respect to editing those recordings and finding a place to put them where they're somewhat secure. That's another topic for another day. But today, um, we're going to get going here real quick. I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, talk about our protocol and then Matt will as always he'll he'll come and tell everybody how to navigate zoom because a lot of you are new to this and uh, you may have trouble with the, the menu buttons etc so he'll do that real quick and then uh, Bill is going to do his uh, tips and tricks presentation on safety caps uh, Bill uh, has done one every every uh, meeting so far he's done an excellent job Gary will then follow up with buying and selling old radios. This presentation um, will be followed by a brief interruption by Matt to talk about a swap meet option for this meeting. Well, that's kind of an impromptu thing right now. And then uh, I'll talk about some radios that have interesting dials. And then uh, Tom will follow it up with his Wells Gardner 16-2 radio. So that's our lineup uh, for presentations. If somebody's got one, uh, that you want to present today that you want to just throw in there. We have an open slot. And then after that, we're going to do a door prize giveaway. Matt has uh, come up with a, a pseudo random way to, to pick a winner. So we'll do that after all this. And uh, if you saw the invite, you saw, you saw what the prize is. And I won't go into that right now. We'll do that at the time of the giveaway. And then come uh, the concluding, concluding part of this meeting, we'll do an open session you know, I'm not going to moderate at all. You guys can talk about whatever you'd like, and then we'll close it up at 11.30. So that's that's the, the plan for today. And, and I'd like to do a special uh, welcome to the Wisconsin Club members who were invited to join us. And I, I saw that several have uh, registered, and, and so welcome. If you guys want to identify yourself at any point during the meeting, go right ahead. And uh, I think it's great that we can... Uh, all get together and, and we do a lot of corroboration anyway uh, when we have uh, in-face meetings, but this is the first uh, real chance to share with you guys uh, in Wisconsin. Um, I mentioned the door prize. I would like to thank all the presenters we've had thus far. And, you know, there's a lot of interest to do the pre presenting and I, I would like you guys to consider being a presenter. And you'll see a poll question uh, that will be presented to you, to you today, and Matt will, you know, ask that real time and will collect the results. But if you have any interest whatsoever, you know, please, please do so and uh, be a presenter. Uh, you know, last month we had uh, Art go through his collection uh, down there in Florida, and that was that was a fascinating presentation by Art. Uh, Matt Endicott did a brief history of Peter Burns and the American Electric Company. Um, Don Helgeson went through some of his uh, voltometers and uh, Bill did his uh, curtain burner line cord presentation. That was great. And I did a short presentation on some radios that were kind of hidden in plain sight. So we had a full uh, agenda last month. We got an almost full one this month. I'd like to keep that going. And so please, if you have any interest whatsoever, that email address there right there on your screen email us and tell us you're interested and, and we'll go and uh, get you signed up to present. So the, the protocol here for the, is we'll give you 10 minutes to talk. If you need more time because you've got a more in-depth presentation, we'll give you that. Um, you know, just you can ask for questions at the end of your presentation or we can just let people interrupt you as you go. That's your choice. And uh, my, my uh, statement to everybody out there is please stay on mute unless you have a question to ask. Because otherwise, with a lot of people out there, 
we start to get phones ringing and dogs barking and it interrupts the presenter. So, so please make sure you're on mute uh, unless you really have something to say. So with that being said, I'll uh, turn it over to Matt and Matt can uh, give you his, uh, his pitch on uh, navigating Zoom. So I will stop sharing my screen. And then after Matt, um, Bill will come in and talk about safety caps. Okay. I'll try to keep this short because uh, I think pretty much everyone who's already joined the meeting know how to operate most of the things. But um, if you move the, it's a little different if you're operating on a Mac than it is from a PC, but there is the menu bar, uh, which I'm showing. Uh, and if you move your mouse, that will pop up. Uh, on a Mac, it's on the top. On, uh, on PCs, it's on the bottom. Uh, the main big button that everybody knows is the mute unmute button. Uh, as was said, uh, please use it uh, like a push to talk. The little up and down arrow there, that's also where you control all your audio settings. So if you want to change your mic or your speaker, that's where you select it. Uh, video stop start uh, is to the right of that. And similarly, the little up and down, the little arrow button here is uh, for your video settings. If you move over, you have participants. And if you open part, I can't share this, so I can't show it, but if you open the participants window by clicking on participants, you'll see a list of all the participants and there you'll have options to do things. One of the options uh, for yourself is to change your name. As we mentioned earlier, these meetings are recorded and they will be uh, possibly posted on YouTube. And if you have any, uh, you know, concerns about your name being on YouTube, uh, you could change it. Um, so I'm going to be referred to as Tom Kleinschmidt going forward. Um, the next window over is uh, the chat button. And from there, you can send chats to the entire group or to individuals. And uh, the last one I'll touch on is the screen share. Um, that's what you click on when you want to share one of your windows, one of your monitors or windows. There is a difference between sharing a screen and sharing a window. Sharing a screen is exactly like it sounds. Whatever on the screen, what you see is what everybody else sees. Sharing a window is like sharing an app. So if you had a PowerPoint presentation or a uh, pictures that you wanted to share, you could share that window. And in PowerPoint, for example, uh, you could be showing the presentation view in the share and you see the presenter's view, uh, which lets you see your notes in the next slide and stuff like that. So there are opportunities to get fancy if you want, but there's no need to. That's all I've got, uh, except one comment. Uh, we do start these meetings a few minutes before uh, the, the hour uh, to give people a chance to uh, play with their controls. And if anybody has any questions, uh, that would be a good time or you could contact me afterwards. I got a question. Uh, Tom wanted to know how to do a background uh, display. So that is under um, video options. It says choose virtual background. Um, you select the a background uh, and it gives you an opportunity to add a background if you don't have one. Uh, but I will warn you that um, it does require some specific capabilities of your computer. And if your computer doesn't uh, have those capabilities, it won't let you do it. It's easier for the computer to give a background if you have a green screen, uh, but we probably don't have green screens. Okay, take it away, Tom. All right, Matt, thank you very much. So let's get our presentation section kicked off here. I'll turn it over Let to me. Bill. Basically, for all of us who fix radios, I know all, not everybody does, but everybody owns radios and they all have capacitors in them. We know that of all the components ever in, in a radio that is probably the most 
unreliable part ever designed by engineers is the capacitor. It's far worse than vacuum tubes, as it turns out, and probably even worse than resistors and transformers and other sort of things. Capacitors have been the bane of most people who are repairing radios. It's the, it's the part that, that uh, dies the earliest. Now, being an engineer by trade, because that's what I did for many years at Zenith, um, remember our radios were designed to, to a price point and to a, a, a lifetime. We are obviously trying to restore radios that are typically anywhere from 30 to 90 years old. Nobody ever expected a radio to last that long. They were designed to be useful for some period of time, maybe 20 years. And that was really the design criteria at the time. It's built to a price point. And capacitors certainly lived in that, in that window. They did serve the purpose they were designed for. So understand that capacitors are really doing what they're supposed to do. The fact that they're unreliable is something we deal with because of the hobby we're in and what we're trying to recover out there. The only thing that I know that lasts a long time, and I think Tom Kleinschmidt will attest to this, is probably machine tools that are 100 years old. If they're not kept in a, rust for, in a rusty environment, machine tools tend to last forever, but not so much with electronics. So with that said, safety capacitors, or sometimes known as line capacitors, and they have other names, were inputted into radios and I'll specifically say radios, but it's in almost all electronic devices, for one purpose originally, and that was to eliminate the noise that occurs on the AC line. Um, anybody who's repaired a radio realized the radio will work without it. If you clip this capacitor out of the circuit, the radio will continue to play because it, it doesn't need it ultimately to receive radio reception. But what it does do, and you'll notice if it's bad or if you clipped it out, the radio might have tunable hum. Uh, this is especially a problem with AM radios, typically not with FM radios. So you'll notice if you have a tunable hum problem, it's probably because the safety cap is, or line cap is open. So let me uh, move my next slide here. Uh, come on, we gotta go over here. All right, so this is a schematic diagram of a, of a typical All-American 5 radio. Uh, AC-DC radio. Uh, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor. If you can, that's fine. If not, you will notice that the line cord, where the AC line card comes in, there is a capacitor that is across the line. And this is what is known as the line capacitor, or in our case, we're talking about as a safety capacitor. And shameless plug, I use the Zenith radio since that's who I work for. Although this circuit's pretty much the same for everybody. So this is typically an AC-DC radio uh, or an AA5 radio as we spoke of in the past. So these caps generally occur across the line. When they fail, they typically fail by heating up because they've got this AC voltage across them all the time and they tend to short. And when they do, and this is courtesy uh, Tom, uh, he sent me this picture of a capacitor that blew up, a uh, famous uh, bumblebee capacitor. And actually, the bumblebee capacitor is considered an improvement over the old wax capacitor because it was plastic encased. And it was thought that at the time that less moisture would get in the capacitor, and hence the capacitor would probably last longer. Uh, ultimately, that wasn't true. What it did do is it probably encased the, uh, the heating of the, of, the, of the device, and instead of just oozing wax out of it, it basically violently exploded, as shown in this picture here. So line caps in, in AC-DC operations are typically across, across the line. Uh, a second way of putting these capacitors in is in transformer-operated radios. Uh, in this case, this is a chunk of a Heath kit radio. Um, and I just took the power supply. And you'll notice, if you look where the uh, power line comes in, there are two capacitors. Uh, typically, rather than going across the line, what they'll do is put a cap from the line to the chassis and another cap from the other side of the line to the chassis because at the time polarized plugs were not well known and uh, you didn't know which way it was going to get plugged in but the idea was to siphon off the, the uh, RF interference to the chassis. So this is why we have uh, two caps typically in a transformer operated radio. There are some cheap companies that only put one cap in there but the right design criteria was to put two caps in there to ground. So this is typically what you saw in 
transformer coupled ra uh, transformer operated radios. And, and you Bill, excuse me, this is uh, someone who really doesn't know schematics and is trying to learn that. Can you point to where those capacitors are? Can you see my cursor? There? Can you see my cursor? Uh, now I can. Okay, so it's these two caps here. I wasn't sure if my cursor shows up. Yeah, it's these two caps here. Gotcha. So, so the power comes in here and goes through these caps, and this would be a representation of the chassis in this radio. So the caps are basically in this. Ignore. Oops, I'm sorry. I really want to do that, but that that other shot. Let's go cool. backwards, back, back, previous. There we go. Um, this is just the power switch. So, so in this case, these caps. Um, you know, there were two of them. So no matter which way you plug the line in, one of them surely was going to take neutral to ground to your chassis. So understand one other thing. In the tube radios we typically repair or we're trying to restore, safety caps, I guess in quotes here, really weren't spec yet. That was something that's really more of a, a late 60s, early 70s thing that capacitor manufacturers realized, and that's when what we call XY caps, and I'll get into that in a second, uh, really came about in the spec of capacitors. But in the old tube radio days, they didn't spec them that way. So typically the cap that went across the line was no different than the coupling cap that you saw in other parts of the circuit or decoupling caps that were used in, in the circuit. So they were just plain paper caps because they weren't called safety caps and so, so there was nothing special about the capacitor. It was the same capacitor that was used everywhere else in the circuit. So by, we got into more safety conscious things as we moved toward the 70s in design. And uh, basically people like UL didn't want your house to burn down. So, so they, they started designing caps to be more safety conscious. So Cap, the caps are also known as death caps. Yes, well, and I'll, show, and I'll explain why they were called death, death caps. And you're absolutely right about that. Uh, but why are they called X caps and Y caps? That's an interesting nomenclature. This is all, uh, I mean, you can search this out on the web and I pulled this off of a, a whole site that goes through the whole explanation of these, these capacitors. So this was the application where the line cord came in and the cap was across the line. And yes, when it died, it blew up, right? Uh, and this is a case where the cap was connected from the line to the chassis. All right, so this is an X cap, and this is considered a Y cap. And there is a difference in the specification of the capacitors. These caps, or X caps, are actually designed when they fail, if they fail, they're not designed to fail, but if they fail, they're designed to actually short. And I know that sounds a little ridiculous, but if you design the product properly, it's fused, fused in one of these lines here, so if it shorts, it would blow a fuse and tell you it's time to replace this cap. But if you use an X cap here and it failed and you had this plugged in the wrong way, your transformer operated device would now be shorted to the line and it becomes a hot chassis. So Y caps are designed to fail open. They don't fail short. So you can use Y caps in this application, it'd be okay, they just open up, but you never would use an X cap in this application because if it fails, it could possibly turn your cold chassis receiver into a hot chassis. So if you're gonna put caps in and you wanna be safe, you really wanna buy, you can buy something called an XY cap, which is basically a Y cap. And if you go search these out on Mouser or any of the other parts, parts manufacturers and all the modern manufacturers make these parts. Um, they spec them as X caps, X or Y caps or X Y caps. Uh, they come in three classifications: class one, two, and three. Uh, nobody in restoring radios needs a class one cap. Those are typically industrial for high high pulse currents. Uh, typically, we use what's known as a class two cap. And we're, we live in North America. I'm guessing there's nobody here from Europe or other parts of the world where you have 220 volts. So we're generally dialing at line voltages that are really in the 110 volt, 120 volt ranges. Um, and these caps are designed for the fact that they can deal with spikes that come down the line, because that's one of the reasons they fail and why they're in a position where they can cause a failure, where normally caps on the other side of the circuitry, where it's used within the DC circuitry of the radio or elsewhere in the radio, 
They don't see the high transients that occur on the line where these gaps are subject to the transients that can come down the line. So they're designed to accept these transients. So they, they have that specification. Now, if you're crazy enough to put in plain old um, film caps, which would be modern ones, you wouldn't put in paper caps anymore. They'll work as they are filtering, but they may fail. So for safety's sake, you probably want to buy Y caps or XY caps. I'm not so sure you need to buy X caps only. Uh, they're typically, if you look at them, they look like, uh, uh, like ceramic disc caps, typically the way they're constructed. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't run a picture. If you do, if you do a, a Google search on safety caps, you'll come up with this, this, where I got this picture, you'll come up with this website. Um, and it goes to this entire explanation I just went through fairly quickly with you, but understand why these parts are there and, and why they get used and why they were never considered a safety cap in a tube radio because the concept really wasn't thought of until the death of tube radios. It's, it wasn't considered at the time. And that's my presentation. Hopefully that will help you guys. You got any questions? I got a question. Can you use the uh, yeah. X cap in a Y position? No, you don't use an X cap in a Y position. You can okay. use a Y cap in an X position. Well, because can't. an X cap can file, fail short, you would end up with possibly creating a hot chassis situation on, on a, uh, basically uh, you creating a, a hot chassis on a transformer operated device and you don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, hey, Bill, I, aren't, aren't most of those 0.05s? Uh, they can be. Uh, the actual the actual uh, value of the cap get varied, uh, but anything over like you know 0 0.01 and up is going to take care of the RF interference because that's the, really what you're trying to get rid of the noise that occurs on the line. Quite frankly, there's so much power line noise on the AM band these days that. <laughs> you, you, you probably already know it's really tough to listen to AM radio these days because we have a lot more a lot more hash in that in that in that uh, spectrum. That's just a consequence of our lovely digital world. Bill, now, is having just done a uh, five two radio repair or restoration, uh, encountered some of exactly the same stuff. So uh, I have two questions that came out of it. First of all, though. Um, yeah, three of those uh, tubular caps were bubbled. Uh, when I got them out, I did find one that checked out totally gone on my tester. I replaced them with later vintage caps, and uh, everything came back, except I did have to do the filter cap, too. The first question is, uh, because um, these were all regular tubular caps with DC ratings on them in an AC application, does polarity matter if you use that, you know, a DC rated cap, does it matter which way it goes back in the circuit for the replacement or is it uh, uh, of no consequence? For As it? a line cap, it doesn't make any difference. It won't make any difference. And you can put that in there. As again, as I said, the radio is never UL rated for this application because it was not done at the time and if you want to be period period specific you can put another tubular cap in that location understand that um it's not really designed it was never really designed to accept the transients occur on on ac lines it would probably not fail obviously it worked for you know 60 years in the radio world and we did that uh it's just that today if you were trying to pass that radio through ul rating it would never pass you're not trying to do that. You're just trying to make a period specific. And certainly a new mylar, a more, my, a, you know, I would use a 600 volt, you know, DC cap would pr probably work okay. And a new mylar one would certainly <laughs> outlive any of the old paper caps because the, the failure mechanism in paper caps was actually the paper itself would decay because the acids in the paper would suddenly start to break down over the years. Um, what protected it was the wax prevented the uh, in, infiltration of, of moisture, which caused the breakdown of the paper. And again, the plastic that was used in the bumblebee caps or other manufacturers was again, trying to stop the moisture from getting to the paper. Uh, they lasted the 20 years they were supposed to last. <laughs> and, and, you know, but if you, want to, if you want to take one of those nice new yellow caps or whatever and shove it inside a cardboard tube and fill it with wax, I'm sure it will work. Okay, um, 
Yeah, and uh, that was what I, you know, I, I had inherited actually from a uh, another Zenith engineer, <laughs> a fair assortment of stuff, a lot of which is still in my basement. But um, the next thing I came up with, and I didn't have any charts that showed me, but a uh, couple of the units that I put in were the black molded body, and they had no polarity marking except I suspect that maybe the lead coming out of one side, which all of them had a, like a bead of solder look to them, uh, would that have been considered the negative for those well, caps? Was that hey, you, know, um, you know what I'm going to do here, guys? I'm going to uh, interrupt so that we can get on with the other pr presentations. Yes. So what, what we're going to do now is move to the next presentation, Bill, if that's okay with you. You got any final yeah. remarks? I'll be happy to answer that after after the fact. Let's let everybody go through it. Yeah, I think in the effort to, uh, you know, we we went over our uh, time, and then and I know you got a lot of discussion you'd like to have, so <laughs> let's just defer that to the open session, and we'll move over next to uh, to Gary's presentation about buying and selling all radios, so that we can get through all this. All right. And, By being heard, okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Pass the test here. Anyway. Um, because of uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis and so forth, in case you all have not noticed, uh, there are no ARCHE meetings going on at the time. And those of you who like to buy and sell radios, well, you probably will consider the fact that, well, you can't buy or sell any radios. Well, if you're here, you obviously have a computer. So that would mean there's your greatest tool right there to buy and sell radios. There are a number of sources that are, uh, that are on there that are, that are out there, uh, internet websites and such too, that I'm gonna give you some hints and where you could still um, buy and sell radios. Uh, some of the banter that I'm gonna include here may be my opinions on what goes on, but being that I've been buying and selling radios uh, recently on the internet, you can kind of go by what I'm saying and uh, ask questions uh, when, when the time comes. Some noted places to buy and sell on the internet. I'm gonna start out with everybody's uh, favorite here, uh, which is eBay. Uh, some of you have had luck with it, others of you have not. So, well, it's it's still out there and it is still a uh, reliable uh, reliable tool. Um, it may not be a good uh, choice uh, that you may think of. One hint that you could do if you're familiar with eBay and you like shopping for radios, uh, you can, uh, look for local people that are buying and selling radios within within your area where you could drive and uh, locally pick up um, pick up radios too. Not only that, if you avoid shipping on eBay, um, you eliminate the, uh, the, the risk of having things being damaged in shipping. I'll give you a point after that. Um, naturally, if you do buy or sell on eBay, and the radios are damaged, well, you could go through the process of refunding or getting a refund, but still you've lost a radio. So um, that's that for uh, for eBay. And in any cases, PayPal is your friend. Uh, whether you're buying or selling, that's uh, normally the way that you do business on eBay. Um, I've had some good success with Craigslist. It's pretty good. However, you gotta be on top of things. Uh, if you are going to sit and do like I frequently do and say, well, let me think about it. If there's a good deal on there, it's gonna be gone. Before you could even open up the the ad on Craigslist, uh, things happen to be just, uh, just come and go. Um, if you do consider Craigslist at all, uh, know your limits of travel. Uh, beware that, hey, is this radio going to be worth traveling 50 miles uh, to and from for a clock radio or something not too expensive? Um, you know, the, the things to naturally consider there and uh, location and time of availability. And also another thing that I've, I've noticed uh, too is uh, people are not really, they're really, really limited by making point-to-point uh, -point contact. Now, uh, because of the COVID-19 thing as well, too, and they'd rather ship. So uh, just be clear on who uh, who wants to meet up with you and, and so forth. Um, you can, of course, wheel a deal on Craigslist if you could uh, make them reasonable offers. Well, the way you, way you go. Um, 
above all, be courteous uh, with the seller and arrange for a definite time. Um, I ran into a great deal um, about a month or so ago, and it, it went through, but they were pretty uh, – I was one of the first people to offer this person a deal on two radios, uh, good ones, but they were like, are you on your way? Are you, are you going to hang in? and be there and I showed up on time. So give them the courtesy of when you're going to actually show up. It's uh, uh, be considerate of their time as well too. Otherwise they're gonna pass along to somebody else or just totally. Um, you never know who it may be who you're dealing with out there in the uh, in, uh, Craigslist or eBay uh, land. Could be a fellow club member and naturally you don't wanna piss them off. Um, made uh i made mention of the uh, travel distance involved you want to travel over 50 miles for a cruddy little radio well that that's up to you i'm i'm sure you you've all dealt with that it's not again this is dealing with the internet you're not there at the uh at the archie swaps someone right there you'll uh you'll get the feel of it um another source i found that's pretty good is the facebook marketplace um, if you're on Facebook, it is a good place. Just uh, go into the marketplace area. By the way, I'm sorry I don't have any uh, comments and chairs. I'm not schooled on uh, on, on chairs. Try to make this interesting with my Facebook marketplace. Uh, just go to marketplace, enter something like antique radios, and away you go. You could skew. Right cases here if you search for uh philco for example you're going to get everything that's in there that's philco which is not just radios it's also refrigerators and you'll also uh see uh some of the new cheap uh record players that they have out too so you'll get everything that's that's and zenith is with you're going to get a lot of the zenith v uh, vcrs and then things as well too but you'll get the hang of it basically do a search for antique radios and away you go and you could skew the search down to um new, newest listed and, and such too and you'll see the whole uh, the whole list as, as you want it uh, a few other sources on the internet that i found or uh websites called uh one is called offer up and let go um if you google the searches there you'll see that and you could uh uh do those uh do those searches as well for any of you folks that are out of towners tuned into our show just search for the radios in your particular area and uh, again consider the amount of time that you want to travel um i've got a note in here that people that i've run into that's <laughs> keep in mind the people you run into are are not necessarily antique radio people so they don't know some of the basic rules rules of these case in point gentleman's location he was in his garage and uh, he was about ready to plug the radio in to show me it worked i said no don't do that you're gonna blow it up well won't you trust me if it's working I, I assume it's not working i like radios that don't work let those folks know and watch out when they <laughs> when they reach for the plug to go to plug the thing in they could uh, yeah it could be disastrous and um uh, just just one thing to to be aware of uh an important factor about if you're looking to sell radios, if you want to sell your radio, consider a fair market value. There is, a, I, I can't think of the term, uh, I'll just say an awful lot of radios that are out there that if you look and do your searches on the internet, you're going to see radios that's gotten really expensive. Well, not necessarily because folks that are out there selling their radios, they've been cued, they've been skewed into TV shows like the picker shows and all this other jazz. And they're, they've got something in their mind. They being laymen who are not tuned into old radios. They're thinking this radio has got to be worth the thousands of dollars because so-and-so was selling it on this antique radio uh, or antique road show. And away it goes, well, Beware of the fair market value of a radio if you really genuinely want to sell it. If you just want to show off your radio, list it for $1,000 and you show off your radio here. But if you want to sell it of the actual fair market value, I'll give you some hints on how you could judge the value. 
um, for example, like listing on eBay, uh, find the radio and uh, see what the, uh, what they actually sold for on eBay, not for what the seller is wishing they want to get for it. That's a different story. Um, not only will you uh, sell your radio a reasonable amount of time, but you might be of a uh, fellow collector an opportunity to buy the radio. There's so many people out there. I don't, I, I don't really understand what their name of their game is. They're going to list their radios at uh, way less than fair market value. And if they're expecting to get a lot of money, well, you know, and I, if you're shipping, one important thing, if you just don't know a darn thing about how to ship a radio, get somebody else to do it for you. Um, there have been a lot of people that uh, uh, within conversation and myself included, uh, receive radios uh, in a million pieces because someone may have put a radio in a box, wrapped it with some toilet paper and said, okay, that'll do it. Well, the way UPS and FedEx and uh, the post office generally go, they are, uh, they don't treat their packages lightly, even if you run fragile on there. So if you don't know how to do, do um, get a third party involved and um, ensure that you have that radio packed safely because you know, and I know, you know, fine, you uh, you get your money back for the whole thing, but you're going to lose out on on a radio and vice versa, uh, vice versa as well too, because you'll you'll have a a pissed off receiver uh, going well. You did a really raunchy job at uh, at at shipping this thing. You should have known better and so forth. So save yourself some trouble if you do know how to pack and ship. All the power to you. Um, just make sure that whenever you do sell a radio, consider what it costs you to pack and ship that. Granted, if you have free boxes and packing material, add that in with your shipping costs and so forth too. But that's for if you ship and sell radios out of town. Uh, so maybe by now you're thinking, well, I think I'll stick locally to my sales. Well, that's fine and well. I'll just go by what I was saying about uh, places like Craigslist and um, Facebook Marketplace and eBay local uh, shipping and receiving only. You'll save yourself the hassles of, of that. Um, as I mentioned before, don't show off your radio if you haven't tested it unless it's fully restored. Um, you don't want to plug something in and have it explode live in front of the people and just say, well, here it is, smoke and all. Uh, always explain to the folks, as I do, this is as is. There's no warranties with them, and you just want to be honest. Um, and that's almost about it. Just a reminder that if you do have an old radio that you simply do not want, you want to give away, uh, why not donate it to Erky and uh, have us uh, attempt to sell it for you? We would appreciate it because all the, uh, the money that we do receive for it, your radio uh, you know, goes toward, uh, goes toward our club. If you are unsure of the value of your sets, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of people are just asking a lot more money uh, for radios than they're actually worth. If you don't believe what I say, go take a good look. Uh, I wish I could show you some of the, the sections here in particular, some sellers in particular, but I don't want to, uh, screenshot them. They're liable to be on here and come after me with a uh, with a big pickaxe. Uh, but if you're unsure of the values of your set, you can contact us here at Arky, uh, either by email or we do have a Facebook page that I'm kind of in command of that uh, and we'll let you know the true value uh, of the radio, not with any of us in mind to just say, well, I'll, I'm will i not gonna come up to you and say, well, that radio is worth 10 bucks, I'll give you 10 for I've got it personally, I have enough radios right now and I don't really want any more. I'll just sell, tell them, hey, a fair market value for this radio is right there. Plus a lot of us folks that are at Arky or have been, uh, have been buying and selling radios for years and we really do know the true value um, of these radios. So that's, uh, that's about it for my helpful hints for Gary's little radio factory. Is there well, well, thank you very much, Gary, that was a, really comprehensive coverage of uh, buying and selling radios. That's yeah, maybe we can do something again uh, next time or a follow-up and I'll have some interesting slides like yeah. <laughs> like Bill did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. And and on a related note, uh, Matt, a member of the Zoom team, Matt Hawk, he's got a, 
a little idea here you'd like to run by us. So, Matt, are you there? I am. Um, so, a number of us are interested in buying and selling stuff. That's why we go to swap meets, right? So we decided that we would try to use the Zoom team to offer that as a venue for uh, showing your wares to buy and sell stuff uh, within the club. So at our next session, uh, we're not exactly sure of the details, but at our next session, uh, we're gonna have a, a uh, part of the meeting uh, where people can uh, show what you have for sale, and then um, people would make their transactions outside of the meeting. So the way I was thinking this would work is that you simply uh, have pictures or a list or pan the room or however you want to do it, um, and then advertise your contact information in the chat window. And if anybody's interested in following up with you, they can. Um, not, we're not trying to turn this into a live auction or anything like that. Um, the, uh, the only point to make is just like a swap meet, uh, the club is not making any representations about uh, the merchandise or the transaction whatsoever. It's simply a, a vehicle for you guys to have private transactions amongst yourself. Uh, so that will be uh, on the agenda next week. Um, if you're interested, uh, please let us know by sending an email to uh, remote-events uh, at antiqueradios.org so we get some idea of uh, what the participation is going to be, and we'll work it in next month. Okay. I have a question. Uh, regarding the uh, Craigslist, uh, you got to watch out for some scammers. Uh, what I did one time was I put a couple speakers on for a hundred dollars. Guy oh, yeah. came, a guy came back and offered me fifty dollars more to take it off, and uh, he wanted me to uh, have he's going to have somebody else pick up the speakers and then put them in storage. <laughs> I said okay, I'll, I can do that. Then they found out he sent me a check for twenty five hundred dollars <laughs> to uh, <laughs> really, yeah, a, a certified check. The twenty-five hundred dollars, so I can deposit it in my bank account, and then pay out of my bank account. These people, and uh, what happened was I didn't, didn't, I didn't, I destroyed the check. But what happened was they, uh, they would, uh, the the check would bounce. Of course. So, so I would <laughs> yeah. be paying the twenty-five hundred dollars for the guys to store store the stuff into their lockers, whatever it was. So just be careful, make sure, I always sure. do uh, local delivery and cash only. <laughs> yep. So on I'm, Craigslist. Yep. Right. On your listing as well as buying and selling. There's also people that list, oh, I haven't seen it for radios, but other other items where the deals are too good to be true. You know, one thing you can note on there is there's a way out of town, out of state phone number. Just give us a call and they'll text you back and they'll say, hey, uh, Here's a coupon number. So that Craigslist is notorious for scams. Put that on the bottom of your priority list for uh, buying and selling radios, really. Um, yeah. Selling selling is another thing, too. It's, to be honest with you, that that's it's a disaster. I've had more luck on, on Facebook Marketplace um, than anything. But uh, good point, Rudy. Thank you. Uh, I'll go along with that, uh, with that scammer uh, thing. I put something on, on Craigslist. I think it was for fifteen dollars, and almost immediately I got uh, I got a response, and he wanted me to he wanted me to uh, he wanted to send a, a a Google six digit code or something, and I thought, That's oh it. wait a minute, something's wrong here, and I looked up uh, I looked up the area code, and I realized that cell phones you you know you move throughout the country, but I uh, I got back to him, I yep. said, you're really going to drive from Atlanta to buy fifteen dollars worth of wheelbarrow parts? Uh. End of conversation. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, gentlemen. I think we can talk more about this in the open session. Uh, right now, I'm going to uh, flip it over to share my screen with my presentation. So, you guys see that okay? Yep. Good. Okay, great. Um, so, I went through my collection and and, and 
looked at uh, some radios that were kind of unusual in terms of their dials. So, <clears throat> first one is a, a Zenith radio that you've probably seen one of these out there, made in 1936, uh, 1937, I should say, but the dial is totally in French. And uh, it's, it's, I've never seen a, a Zenith dial that wasn't in English, but this one is totally in French and all the words are there in French and it uh, turns out the word Zenith is a word in, in French, so they didn't have to translate it. But it's got this really cool uh, globe logo with a couple of speakers on each side and some lightning bolts and uh, it's kind of a neat looking logo. And here's a close up of that, that dial and uh, the, there are four bands in this radio and uh, the word uh, GOM is range and the frequency is listed in meters, not in, in uh, hertz or cycles per second like it would be in the U.S. And uh, down here at the bottom <coughs> where the four knobs are, you've got this uh, changeur de gomme, which uh, looks like game changer, but it's really just the uh, band selector. And then you've got the, the tuning knob, which is this uh, reglage. I'm butchering the French language, but uh, we'll press on. And then tone is pretty easy to see, tone light. And, uh, on, off, and volume is this interrupt and volume. Volume is basically the same word. So what, what's also interesting about this dial is they printed just about every city they could possibly fit on here. There's, there's all kinds of names of all these towns, both in France and in Europe. They're all over the place down here. And uh, what's, what's missing on this dial is the red uh, split second tuning pointer, uh, which is this micro relage, which is the fine tuning pointer. So I've got to find one of those for this radio when I get around to restoring it. But that that was a, kind of an overview of this, this dial. The other interesting things about this, well, interesting to me at least, is uh, you compare it to the, uh, the domestic version, which is the 5S119. This is the the European one is the 5A119A, and the, uh, the A's out there, instead of the S means uh, in the first position, the, the A here in red means that it's all wave. That means that it's, it's got the long wave, and uh, the A suffix means that it's an export version, meaning that you can set the primary on the transformer from anywhere from 110 to 250, and it's also got a phono jack and switch. So if you look at the domestic version, which I've got a picture of right here, which is all in English, you can see that it's only got three bands, and you know it's it's listed in in frequency instead of uh, meters, and obviously it's the Zenith logo and everything's in English. Quick question. Here's a it's kind of a busy chart here, but I uh, just wanted to pack all this info on one sheet. But the extra band is this really low frequency band, 100, 148 to 400 kilohertz. And I'm not sure what they used it for back then. If anybody knows, I'd be interested to hear. It, it was used as a broadcast band in Europe. Oh, was it? Yes. Yeah, it still is, I believe. Yeah. I especially think, the, especially the French. Long wave stations. Oh, that's it's pretty low, huh? Yeah, we don't use it here. <laughs> Quick yeah. question. Yeah. Have you ever seen, if, I mean, if you redid the cabinet, you know, clean it up and such, have you ever seen Radio Days have the water decals for the tone and the volume and all that in French? No, I've never seen that. Do they? That I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Oh, no, I, I don't think they do. I mean, if, if you look at this radio, they're – there is no decals on it, you know, there's... On, on a, you mean by, by the knobs? On yeah, the, there's, no, there's no decals on this radio there. It's all on the, on the, uh, in, in the same thing on this one I saw on the, on the website here. I, if you go to this site, the U.S. version uh, didn't have any decals on it either. 
Okay, just so, curious. Um, and then, so the way you would set the uh, primary voltage on the back, this is the back of the chassis, this picture here is there's a little jumper wire that comes out and you can, you can pick whatever tap of the primary on the power transformer. Uh, so you could, and you can see this one was set to 235 volts. So, I mean, so if you looked at this radio, the domestic version versus the foreign version, it's, the case is identical. There's, there's no difference that, that you can see other than the dial. Quick question on the voltage thing. Yeah. Uh, would that have also been for different frequency than 60 hertz? Like if you have that here and plug it into 110, uh, will that transformer run on R60 hertz? Yeah, it, it'll work. It, you know, there's efficiency issues about what um, what voltage you actually get out. If you, you know, some transformers, you know, will be more efficient at one frequency than another. But I think they took that into account when they provided all these taps to say, you know, if you, if you set it for 235 at 60 hertz, you might get a little higher V plus voltage than if you were running it at 50 hertz, say. So it, it should work. It's just... Um, Typically, transformers for, for, for lower, lower uh, frequencies are just have more iron in them. So if you look at a 25 hertz transformer, it's got a lot of iron. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a pretty tall transformer, probably due to, the, to that fact. If you look, there's a picture on the next page, or one of these pages here, but I'll press on here. Um, what else is interesting about this radio? Well, um, it was found in Italy, and, and you saw that it was configured for 235 volts. And uh, inside the chassis, there's somebody had worked on it some sometime in the past with French uh, capacitors in there. So it's who knows where it's this thing has been, but uh, it you know it, got, it lasted through World War II, so uh, it's a survivor. Also, uh, this year, 1937, was kind of when Zenith started to sell a lot more radios. Uh, compared to 1936, uh, they doubled their sales. And that, so this is like the, you know, when, when the crest of the wave of Zenith's popularity in terms of mass market started to happen. And uh, also, this is a, this radio has got a copper-plated chassis, which was the first year that, uh, that Zenith started doing that, and uh, and the other the other thing that I pulled from these references is that uh, thirty six and thirty seven were the first years they started using the black tiles, the big black tiles, and uh, you know Commander McDonald, quote unquote, wanted to be able to tell where the radio was tuned from across the room. So this is kind of like the first example of using the phrase "go big or go home." You know, it's it, it kind of set the trend in the industry and a lot of the other manufacturers started to follow with big dial radios at that point. And I'll, you know, I'll put a plug in for these books, but these Zenith books, if you can see if my picture showing off to the side, you know, these, these Zenith books that I'm citing as references are just full of information. They're, they'll tell you all about, you know, these, these sets and, you know, how to decode the part numbers and how many units of each chassis they built and that sort of thing. It's fascinating stuff. Um, I guess I didn't have a picture in here of the chassis to, to answer that question that related to the amount of iron in the chassis in the transformer, but I did put the schematic in here and you can see the, the primary and all the different taps on it. How does that uh, copper chassis look today? Well, you know, it's it's got a little bit of crud on it. Um, I don't have another picture of that in here. Other than that right there, you can see that it's got some corrosion on it, but it, it, uh, it's not perfect. So that's, that's my first interesting dial radio. The next one is not so uh, elaborate, but it's unusual. This is um, an X-Time T87, which is a I don't have a huge collection, and I haven't seen that many radios in my life, but I've seen a few. But this is the only one I've ever seen with Roman numerals on the frequency dial. 
So, I, I'd be interested to know, know if anybody's seen, seen that in any other radio. So I've seen a lot of clock radios with Roman numerals, but uh, we take a special person to figure out what the tuning dial really means there. <laughs> yeah, you got you got to do a little study. You know? At least at least they didn't use like pig Latin or something like that. Um, so it, it you know there's nothing really special about this radio, but it's interesting, and uh, there's some other things about it that are interesting. Uh, it, you know, it's a nice red bakelite cabinet, and uh, it's got this solid brass under cabinet mounting bracket. So it's you know, that's kind of unusual too. You don't see a lot of radios like that. And, uh, you know, these, these uh, numerals are molded into the case and the metal knobs are, are solid metal. They're, they're heavy duty. And this one's plated and the plating's coming off. This one looks like it's in pretty good shape, but it's got some corrosion on it. The logo, the x sign logo is, is kind of a raised plastic add on. And it's, you know, it's your basic all American fire radio and it's got this uh, magna wand antenna, which was their, their marketing term for it, which is a ferret loop stick. So some other interesting stuff about the x time is that uh, the uh, Tony x time bought the El Tatro Radio Company of Decorah, Iowa in 1939. And he moved it to Minnesota. And, and then he started to, he started to do his uh, uh, his own brand, x radios, but he continued to make the farm radios and later uh, added these car radio, automobile radios. So he did that for a while until uh, 1958 when he sold the company to American TV and Radio of St. Paul. So that's kind of the, the capsule history of the x radio company. I've, I've never seen another x radio, but um, apparently they made TVs and radios. Um, I saw a trade publication out there that said uh, he, he had the company in Leroy, Minnesota and later Minneapolis and I'm guessing this thing was built in the 1950s in Minneapolis. It's, it's a little newer AA5 design in that it uses these integrated RC networks, you know, those, those things that look like capacitors with more than two leads on them. There's, a, there's several of them in this radio, so I figured that's a little more modern than in the 1940s, so I'm guessing it was built in the 50s. And then the final note here is this all ties back to the Midland Radio, which I did a presentation on two meetings ago, which was also from Decorah, Iowa, where Ernie Eckstein bought this company that he moved to Minnesota. So that's kind of a small world note that uh, at least it's interesting to me. The last radio I'd like to talk about today is this um, this Climax radio I have. It's, it's got a really elaborate dial and it's got a movable pointer for each of the four knobs. So each of these four knobs down here has got a dial pointer that moves. So it's, it's you know, the band selector has got a knob, I mean a knob and a dial pointer. The tone has got this pointer and the volume as well as the frequency like most radios. It's, it's really a complex looking affair. I mean, it's a very deep uh, dial. It's got many layers to it. It's probably a half inch deep. And um, this picture here just shows you that there's a dial cord used as the main mechanical means of moving the pointers. You can see this dial cord is broken. This is another one of my unrestored radios. And then the tuning knob uses uh, some friction that moves this big black disc here, which which this pointer is tied to. And so there's a little friction arrangement here where this not, this shaft moves this disc around. So uh, I, I have not restored this thing, so I haven't had a chance to light it up, but it's it looks pretty interesting in terms of the this, there's a translucent disc under here that uh, should light this thing up very nicely, but I, like I say, I haven't restored this one yet, but here's a, a top view of this. You can see how thick this thing is and this whole subassembly kind of free stands away from the chassis a little bit. Well, that's quite unique, I gotta admit. Yeah. Elaborate. <laughs> Looks like a person's face. Yeah. It's <laughs> the angry face radio. 
<laughs> These are all they're, they're, called, they're called the angry face. Yeah. Been expensive to do. Yeah, I imagine it wasn't cheap. Um, are these all your radios by chance? Or? Yeah, these are radios I pulled from my collection. Even the French one, eh? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, and you know, I took four years of French in high school, and I, I still can't <laughs> figure this that out. So I had to go look up those words. Except for Game Changer. That was, oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> So this is some other details about this. It's a seven tube radio. It's got an I tube and uh, it's, it's got the standard uh, broadcast band and two short wave bands, nothing really unusual. It's got a solid wooden back. And what's kind of unusual is it's got the same grill cloth pattern that's used in the front. It's covering this hole in the back. They didn't cover these other holes, but they covered this one and um, I just thought that was a little unusual. And there's its little logo in the back that's right at the top. And the knobs are very ornate, uh, kind of a bird design with a lightning bolt through the, the bird. Makes it pretty cool. So um, the, um, the company, the Climax Company, it's an unusual name for a company. You know, there's, there's not a lot left in the world companies that are named Climax. I know there's a mining company out in Colorado called the Climax and Lubdenum Company, but it's not, it's not a real popular thing you'd name a, you know, a, a mainstream consumer company. You know, it's probably since the sexual revolution, that's probably not a good, good thing. And it's, it's kind of awkward, you know, when you say, yeah, I really want to go to Radio Fest and then find another Climax, you know, it's, it doesn't sound right. Um, Gotta love your radios. I think you got a real nice, unique radio that's uh, really an addition to anybody's collection. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I've, I've tried to figure out what the model number is. So I know it's in this range based upon the writer's schematic. Um, I looked at radiomuseum.org. They have a tombstone version with this. And I think somebody out there, I just heard a, a comment about the angry face radio. That's what they call it on the radiomuseum.org site. And, uh, and then uh, Climax apparently merged with General Te Television Radio in 1939. And going forward, they didn't use the name Climax anymore. So that's that. So that's my presentation. There's the schematic, um, nothing really too unusual about it, other than the fact that it's the same schematic for this range of models. So I know my, my models in there somewhere. And some references. So, and, uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing here. If there's no other questions, I'll turn it over to Tom Kleinschmidt, who's going to talk about his Wells Gardner radio. Uh, just to make one comment before we do, if we can. Yeah. Uh, we were talking earlier about the transformers in 50 hertz and 60 hertz. Just yeah. an interesting sideline. Uh, a lot of you guys probably know this, but, uh, you know, uh, World War II and maybe even later, uh, power on airplanes was run at uh, 400 hertz rather than uh, 60 hertz. I see some head shaking um, because it allowed them to use smaller components, smaller transformers. And when you're on an airplane, it's important to have uh, less iron, and <laughs> lighter weight. And if you listen to the audio in headphones on an airplane, it tended to, you could hear the 400 hertz frequency, you know, because of filtering and the electronics. It, it was much higher pitched than what we're used to as 60 cycle hum because the hum would be 400 hertz. Yeah, and I think a lot of the old car radios with multi vibrator were uh, higher frequency in their power transformers. I, I, I think a vibrator is 118 hertz. 118, yeah, 118 hertz. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not going to tell you I'm an expert on this radio, but I did pick up a version of it. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
Um, so Wells Gardner, as many of you know, and this is going to tie right into what Tom was talking about with Climax. A whole bunch of people, I think, made radios for Climax. I think they were one of those kind of wacko brands. Uh, Wells Gardner specialized in making radios for everybody but themselves. I, I, they apparently did market some stuff under their own name, but Montgomery Ward was one of their biggest customers, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the reason there's a close-up of the dial here, which of course can't compete with Tom's Climax dial, but it's still a pretty good looking dial. Um, this is the only one I'm aware of where they actually put the branding on here, Montgomery Ward and Airline. Uh, the rest of them, uh, they did something else. I have one uh, that's a uh, um, La France, and there's a little metal tag here. It says La France, and it's blank up here. And just like Tom's dial, these move when you turn the knobs, but they have a one-way string on them. There's actually like a, a, uh, a spiral clock spring on the back of these things, like, a, like an escapement spring. And so it, it, the spring works against the string going around the knob. So instead of having a conventional round trip on the knob in the, in the same sense as a tuning dial, this thing just moved it and the spring held it in position on both this loud and bass uh, uh, thing here. So uh, here's the cabinet designs. Uh, this one is the most common. Uh, and uh, you notice it's got kind of like a tapered shoulders here and a flat face on the front. This one, according to the same uh, uh, website that Tom uh, mentioned, which is the Antique Radio Forum, was the prototype cabinet. And they may have actually, and there's actually people that have this cabinet. So I think Wards switched the cabinet to this. And I think when Wells Gardner launched the radio, they launched this cabinet. This tuning eye has been added by somebody. These radios did not have a tuning eye. Uh, so, they're pretty plain cabinets in all reality. And of course you can see the ad here on the right. Um, and this $175 price tag is pretty serious for a Montgomery Ward purchaser. And the next radio down in their model series was $80. So that tells you how big a jump this was. So lots of features. This thing had a loudness control on it. You probably saw it on the dial on the right hand side. It had a 30 watt amp with four 2A3s in it two 12 inch speakers, um, the, the dual section volume control cut the sensitivity as you cut the volume down to cut the noise down. Uh, and then the radio, there's, a, there's an RF gain control and there's a, a, a low pass filter and bandwidth selector and so on. And they also had this experimental badge band that went up to 48 megahertz. And that, that's a whole separate thing with this Apex band. If you Google Apex, band, you'll see it. They, they thought it was going to be the next big thing, but FM killed it. So uh, they were trying to get higher fidelity on AM by uh, probably expanding the bandwidth. So this thing goes to 48 megahertz, which is very unusual for uh, you know a, a radio of 1935. Uh, by the way, you guys can jump in with questions as we go here. So if I'm rattling too fast, I'm just trying to get through it all in my 10-minute allotment. So here's the money side over here on the right. I mean, the radio looks kind of ordinary in the front, but on the back you have, you know, all of a sudden it looks like you got a Scott radio in your house. Uh, these are two, as I understand, Jensen A10 12 inch speakers. The, uh, the end bells on these are chrome plated. I've seen them with the entire basket and everything's chrome plated on these on various versions. Uh, 2A3s are all lined up here. This is a, you know, this is a hefty chassis and there's a lot of electrolytics on here. You can see that there are five electrolytic cans over here. They're the screw base style. They used uh, tube socket style connectors all over the place, hooking everything together. So uh, as I understand it again from the old interweb, uh, the prototype was shown at the Century of Progress as the radio of the future. There's a lot of companies that promoted stuff. In fact, if you go online, Scott made a real big deal out of it. And of course, chrome back then indicated quality. So that's why this set's chrome plated. And some of you may be aware that the very first version of the movie dial set that also Wells Gardner made for Montgomery Ward was chrome plated. Um, this is actually generically a Wells Gardner Model 6S F. They actually call it a Series 6 F. And in the world of high fidelity, Scott launched their All Wave 23 high fidelity set in 35, and McMurdo Silver put their Masterpiece 5 set out, which had an 18 inch Jensen woofer in 36. 
So high fidelity was coming into play. You know, high tube count, of course, was a big deal. And this is almost evenly split between the radio chassis and the amp chassis as far as the number of tubes, not exactly, but pretty close. Um, and uh, so that's, that's that piece of the action. Uh, so let's talk about who sold these things and how you identify them. Uh, and there's been some other random brand names. These are the brand names here. Um, Wells Gardner obviously has the 6F. I don't know exactly the years here. The most well-known version is the Montgomery Ward version, and it's a 62197. So trivia fact, if it's got a 62 prefix, it was made by Wells Gardner. Also, if it has a 26 prefix, it was made by Wells Gardner. I've been going through a lot of this decoding of the number system. I hope to put something together for the newsletter at some point, but I don't have it all cranked up. Um, in 1935, as you saw in that ad, it was $175. In 1936, they dropped the price to $159.50. They weren't selling them. And there's also a notion that they really didn't promote them very well. Now the fair store, more, many of you probably don't remember the fair store. When I was a kid, there was one in Ranhurst down the road from me. 1962 was kind of the end of the fair store. And actually Montgomery Ward bought the fair stores in the, in the starting in the fifties, they were buying into them by, by the sixties, they owned the whole show and they changed them all to Montgomery Ward stores. But they were at this counter. It was sort of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, I won't call it Walmart, but it's not, certainly not Marshall Fields. And uh, they sold under the LaFrance brand. There's some notion that that LaFrance brand was sold by other stores in the country as well, but I have no data to support it. But they were selling the thing on a closeout for a hundred bucks. Now it's the same radio that has changed the dial and put the nameplate on it. So that's kind of the show on that. Um, the interesting trivia fact is S.S. Kresge owned the fair stores, the guys that became Kmart and Kmart who bought Sears later on, and that's who sold it to Wards. So just as we talk about all these things of buying and selling and what happens in business all the time, that's what's going on. So Wells Gardner chassis, I'm going to go off on a, on a tangent. In fact, let me point out something I, I forgot. A lot of people call this thing a WG24. That's absolutely wrong, although that number is on the set or on the label. And I'll talk, that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to go left field here a little bit. I just pointed to the right, and it's interesting. Um, this is a Kimball radio that Bill Cohen will tell you that I consulted with him a lot on to try and get the darn thing to work and finally did. I thought this number on the bottom of this cathedral was just the number on the transformer. I thought it was really weird that they had a cutout here so you could read it. Turns out that is the model number. And it's just rubber stamped on the paper. So if somebody replaced the transformer, you wouldn't have a clue what this thing was. So, um, and then you have to decode the bottle number because it's actually a Wells Gardner 6063 version seven. And they had two different chassis layouts. So they also have a 7A, which has a, a, a drum dial instead of a flat dial. It, crazy stuff goes on. So the whole notion of how to identify this stuff, you have to really do some detective work. The LaFrance chassis I have has no markings at all as to who made it, what the model number is or anything. It's actually marked on the label in the cabinet. So if you get one of these things without the cabinet, it is completely a mystery radio to people who have never seen it before. So if you look at this nameplate in the bottom here, this is the patent plate off of, the, off of that cathedral radio. And you see it says WG24 in the corner here. Well, here's the label that's inside the cabinet for the uh, 6F. And by the way, one of the coolest tube layout things I've ever seen in a radio. But here's the patent and license information, very similar to this, the metal plate, it says WG24. So you'd think, well, maybe that's the part number of the label. Well, nope, because it says form number so-and-so over here on this side. And if you look down here, I blew it up, on this tube layout, it also says WG24. And it says form number 1027J, which is different than 1103, I think it's J up here. So the WG24 thing, I have no idea what it really means, except obviously WG is for Wells Gardner. I don't think we can really have to debate that. 24, God knows. I even have some printed documents of a patent and license thing that has a WG24 on the bottom. So, it's not the radio model number. So anybody tells you they got a WG24, you know they've got a, w, a Wells Gardner radio and that's really all you know. 
So here's the, uh, here's the last slide. So this, the, this picture on the uh, left and far right are off the internet. So that's just another cabinet that's the standard cabinet. This is my cabinet after it was refinished. That's as far as I've gotten so far. And I bit the bullet and had it professionally refinished because I knew I'd screw it up. And the reason it was refinished is the finish was literally falling off. Uh, and, and there was just, it was not one of these things where you're gonna do a nice cleanup and have a pretty radio when you were done. So it's sitting waiting for me to get on with it. And uh, so I'll, I'll let, give you guys an update at some point. So that's the whole deal. Anybody got any questions? Well, that's great, Tom. That's a pretty cool radio. Got a comment for Tom. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, uh, you contacted me about uh, needing a part for that chassis. Uh, I still have not retrieved my uh, my other uh, Montgomery Ward radio from New England. Um, so when I do get it, uh, then I'll know if I need a part for it or whatever, and I'll get back to you for that with that bracket. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Tom, I just did a quick calc, and $175 in 1935 is $3,309 in today's money. Yeah, and Montgomery Ward wasn't going to that clientele. Well, So keep in mind, in 1935, a Ford cost about 650 bucks. So, you know, that gives you a perspective on, uh, that's a, you know, it's a third of a Ford. Hey, Tom? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to tell me, but that cabinet looks gorgeous. My question to you is, what did it cost you to have it professionally redone? You're sitting down, right? Yeah. 600 bucks. Wow. Okay. <laughs> It's a beautiful radio, though. There's a few radios I'm willing to invest in, and this was one of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I and, I, and the guy that refinished it has refinished a bunch of radios for other people, so he understands cabinetry and radios and so on, but he's not cheap. Was that Fred Taylor? No, uh, it was a guy, I, I uh, have to look up his name again. He's uh He's north of me in Illinois, up in the kind of, I won't say it's McHenry, but it's that general direction. And uh, he builds custom cabinets for people and custom furniture and a bunch of other stuff. And he really does a wonderful job and he understands the whole lacquer thing. He, this is all done in, in, uh, in the proper toning lacquers and so on. So it's about as close as we could get to what it looked like before. And- uh, it's Beautiful. Yeah. So uh, hopefully I've got, I'm just like this one on the left, I'm missing this knob. So that's the other thing I don't have. And some of the screws around the dial had fallen out because for whatever reason, I guess the wood shrank or something and the screws fell out. Um, but I do have the bezel. And, uh, and what you see on the back of this thing on the right is, I'm sorry, you know, I lied. This is my cabinet before I had it refinished. It's just pictures up in the garage. I took those other ones from the... Uh, from the uh, internet, I, I got myself all confused. But in, the lighting in the garage was very different, so it looks like we refinished it wrong, but actually if you get this under light, it looked like that. Uh, you know, obviously it's gonna be slightly different, but you can see all the dark finish was falling off, and if you got a close-up of the top, there wasn't one place that wasn't scraped or peeling or doing something really weird. And another cabinet he did for me, we did a touch-up and, and preserve, and which is actually more work, but on this one, there was just not enough stuff to preserve. So I'm and sorry Tom, for that error. And Tom, did you have the normal uh, round ring on top of the cabinet where someone had a plant on it and they were watering it? You know, this one didn't, but it had some other issues. And also it was stored in a basement that was damp and the, the whole base here had to be re-glued back together. You can see, if you look carefully and you got a big screen, there's a gap over on, whoops, didn't mean to do that. What happens when you don't put them in a PDF? Uh, there's a gap and uh, the top had started from this fair of minor repairs because nothing had deteriorated. And uh, uh, 
but uh, that was part of the deal. The other fun fact for you is to get this baffle plate out, you have to take the piece of wood out that holds the amplifier and power supply. It actually butts up against it and that piece of wood goes below it. Second fun fact is you can't take the speakers out without taking the baffle out because they just use screws. They didn't use studs. So if you try and loosen these things up, everything just spins. So make sure that these screws are tight before you put the whole thing back in because you'll never tighten it up. So it wasn't completely brilliant on the design. And the third thing is they used carriage bolts to ship this thing with going the chassis into the cab. So there are there were three, I think, on the amplifier, one in the back, one over you can see here. There's a top one on each side of the tuner chassis. So I think the notion was, since this is on shock mounts, you know, the, no, the old rotted rubber we all see, that you took out those carriage bolts when it got delivered. Now this thing had most of the carriage bolts still in it. And, uh, and I, that's the only way they hold the amplifier in, but I think it was supposed to loosen them up and other screws that went up through the bottom of the normal, like you would in any other normal set, even like that one Tom showed you any of those sets where you have screws in the bottom of the cabinet. But obviously for shipping purposes, because this thing weighs 150 pounds or something like that when it's, when it's fully assembled. So, you know, the delivery guy probably wasn't thrilled with this one when he delivered it. Okay. Well, you know, that, that brings us to the end of our presentations and uh, it's almost 1130 here. And so what we're going to do now is uh, first I'm going to thank everybody for presenting today and thank everybody for showing up and participating. And uh, now we're going to give away a door prize. And that uh, door prize is some marketing materials. Uh, Tom, do you have a picture of that? This orange and white thing was a promotion thing to the dealer. So this is free to you means free to the dealer. And they were, they were showing you displays that they would provide and other promotions. See, it says deal one, deal two. This is a two-sided document. Here's the second side. And again, I apologize for the crummy resolution, but in order to get it into the email, I had to make it low res. And then the third thing is this is a sample newspaper ad where the dealer would put their name down in here. And this is all 1940 Philco sets. Now, I will tell you, I've taped some of this back together because you can see the tape right there. At every place there was a fold, the tape was fractured. I've been storing it flat. And when we get it to you, if we're going to mail it to you, I'll roll it up and get it into a tube of some kind so it doesn't get further uh, wrecked. But the good news is the edges are in pretty good shape. And even this newspaper thing has not really fallen apart a lot from acid in the paper yet. It has been taped up. But there's nothing on the back side of this. It's just plain newspaper on the back. Uh, so, uh, and roughly uh, two feet by three feet. I did not measure it, but that's kind of the, the on both of these are about the same size. So, take it away, Tom, or whoever's going to do the raffle. I think Matt's going to do it. All right. Okay. So, first, a couple of notes. Um, so our methods, uh, be they arbitrary and capricious, are final. Um, you need to be present to win. And I'm going to do this in a way that I can show everybody how we're picking a name out of a hat. I'm trying to figure out how to do that so you could see that it was completely random. So over on the right, you'll see a list of the people who registered for the meeting. Um, they may not be present, but uh, most of you are. And on the left over here is a website from random.org, which is a uh, organization that does all this random number generation stuff. So we have 38 registrants. So I have the list set up to select a random number between one and 38. And uh, if we can have a drum roll, I will hit generate and number 26, Michael, are you present? Mike? My computer is from Zenith. <laughs> Congratulations, Mike. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, I guess. Right. So, um, 
please um, just email the group uh, remote-events at antiqueradio.org with the specifics of where you want that sent, and Tom will be happy to send that your way. Okay, uh, is uh, is that on the uh, the email the the invite? I mean that uh, remote dot events or where do I? Yes. Find? Yeah. The other, it is. Uh, the other option, Mike, if you want to just send me a private message, you know how to do that, where it says chat, and then you can select my name, Tom Kleinschmidt. Just send me your your phone number or something, and I can we'll, we'll work it out. Okay. Oh, I see it down at the bottom. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah I'll do one of those. Whichever way you want to handle it. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, great. So that, that was our first door prize uh, giveaway. That worked out pretty well. As this is closing up, I'll, I'll just do a plug for next the next meeting. Uh, if you can, prepare a presentation for the next meeting. We'd love to hear, uh, hear from you, see some new faces, see some new collections, whatever. Uh, just spread this out a little bit. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, we are, the second point I got here is that uh, we said we close up at 11:30, but we can. Matt, we have we got time if we want to do an open session for a few more minutes. Absolutely, I'll leave the uh, session going till noon. Yeah, since we we kind of stretched out some of the presentations uh, because we had an open slot, I think we overshot the runway a little bit, and uh, so we'll have to uh, consider that for next time. But that's my fault as a moderator for letting it run so long. But uh, let's, as this looks like the poll has kind of uh, reached its conclusion here almost. Uh, we okay, can... ending the poll. Okay, ending the poll, there's the results. So we got some people that are interested, so that's good. Um, and some people need more than a month to prepare, so get to work on it now. And, uh, you know, we plan on doing these once a month and, uh, you know, we will have the uh, opportunity to have a lot of different presenters over the next few months. So please chip in and uh, share your knowledge, share your expertise, share your passion for the old radios. Is, is that the new uh, schedule once a month rather than every two weeks? That's, yeah. That's it the never intent. was every two weeks. We were just throwing that around as a, as okay. a national yeah. Yeah, so I think we're looking at the third Saturday of every month. I think that's kind of a rough goal. Okay. We'll work around the holidays and things like that, make sure we don't get a holiday weekend. But, uh, but anyway, um, so I think at this point, I will uh, just turn it over to the open session. So if you guys want to go for it, I'm uh, stepping back as a moderator. Thank you. All right, I'm going to run, guys. Take care. Have a good one. Good collecting week, month. Uh, Bill, before, uh, Bill, yeah. uh, I had that one last question about uh, identifying the, uh, now that I know it's an AC application on those, uh, I call them bypass capacitors. Uh, Cap capacitors, I, those non-polarized non capacitors you're talking about, the, like 0.05s and 0.01s, don't have a polarity. What they do have is an outside foil. And yeah. the outside foil was considered, you want to consider the minus side. It really doesn't matter polarity wise. It's the outside foil because of AC applications. You are trying to shield the capacitor to prevent other extraneous things from getting in there. Typically that's an issue when you're dealing with um, tone capacitors or coupling caps in a, you know, from the plate of one tube to the grid of the other tube. Um, but it's not really an app, not really an issue for the across the line cap. It's not really important. If you're talking about outside foil, and we're talking about bypass caps, like on the screens of tubes, that outside foil should go to the ground, and and then the would be the other side would be the one that goes to the grid. So I think that answers your question. Uh, yeah, that that was pretty much the way I remembered from when I started. But my question was with some of these. They had all the full values and everything, but there was no identifier on the capacitor body for the quote-unquote negative side. And if it did matter, 
I, I didn't have any of my old, well, I don't know if I ever had any charts, but these were all black body caps, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and the only thing I could see different was one lead coming out had like a bead right next to the body. Would that be the indicator for the, you know, for the manufacturer? Off the top of my head, if that's the outside foil, it might, it might be. Those are probably like Sprague caps or Aero, Aerovox caps that were typically the manufacturer. And the black body was, was like the bumblebee caps, but they could be just pure black. It depended what, what, you know, what, what the manufacturer was making. Like I said, it, it isn't as critical as a lot of people think. A lot of people get really anal about it. Um, you know, it's, it, these things are pretty simple <laughs> and, and it, it isn't that big a deal. Uh, it gets me a problem, I guess, if you're trying to shield things for RF and noise and that when odd things start happening, that's why you want to have the outside foil at the right place that should be closer to the ground potential. That's really what you're looking to do. Um, but I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember if somebody else can chime in about that beat on the end of the cap. I do remember, I think, on some spring caps were built that way. Uh, hey, Bill. Yep. Um, I'm not, are, are you talking, is uh, Ed talking about the uh, uh, black body caps? They'd have some uh, uh, color coded value and then they'd have a little nub sticking out one side. Yeah, yeah. And I think those are like the, like the bumblebee caps that Sprague made. Yeah. Uh, those, some, weren't some of those oil filled? They could be. It was another technique to try and limit the amount of moisture, you know, getting in. But ultimately, it did, and that's why they fail. Yeah, I, I think I, I read somewhere where they, or heard somebody that uh, uh, that was like the uh, the oil, uh, how they how they got the oil into oh, it, the, the fill. That's thing. perfectly possible. I don't really know. I, I yeah, yeah. It looks like just a, a little bead of solder on the lead as it comes out of the capacitor body. No color bands or anything for the ID. These were uh, completely labeled, you know, 600 volt DC, 0.02. Um, I don't think I... But actually labeling them as plus and minus would be a misnomer because there is no polarity on that kind of cap. It's truly whether it's the outside foil or the inside foil. It, it, right, that's what I was uh, thinking. And, you know, I remember all the stuff about, you know, some circuits were hot enough that they wanted to make sure the the incoming signal was on the foil, the uh, one going to the grid was on the inside, whatever. So um, yeah, I was just curious because it, it looked like it was something that a manufacturer would have known. And the reason I ask you, because uh, I think these came out of the can of stuff from my buddy up the street, uh, uh, Frank Bocci, Zenith engineer. Now passed away. Mike? <laughs> Mike and I both worked at Zenith. Yeah. Couple comments. Yeah, let me. Can I throw one out here about your uh, your caps? Uh, I got a place an order with Newark, Elec Newark Electronics in New Jersey, and they were selling uh, X1 Y2 caps for eleven cents a piece, and I bought two hundred of them. They're uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a, it looked like a pretty good deal and the specs on them were like 10,000 picofarad. Uh, voltage rating is uh, X 440 volts and the Y rating was 300 volts. And they look, they're a little yellow cap, a little uh, disc capacitor. And um, I thought it was a pretty good deal and uh, I appreciated your, your talk there because I know that uh, there's a couple of schools of thought and one of them is across uh, the line and another one is uh, uh, some people actually say use three of them. So I, I didn't understand the uh, difference between the X and the Y, and you cleared that up, and I appreciate that. Yeah, and since these are rated XY caps, they can go into either application. It, it, yeah. It, yeah. And so what you bought is a good deal. You can use those forever. They'll work. Yeah. Okay. Another fun fact, that picture that I sent to Bill, um, the uh, power switch is also blown up in that same radio. Because if you look at Bill's first schematic, I believe, it showed the power switch and the capacitor uh, across the line. And the power switch is absolutely open on that, on that set. Uh, I didn't get a chance to shoot a picture of the chassis to show you where it's located, but it probably isn't critical to what Bill was doing. So, um, you know, they, they can cause some additional damage, I guess is the point I'm making. 
Oh, so, oh ab absolutely. <laughs> not counting blowing the fuse in your house. That exploded cap actually wasn't from you, Mr. Kleinschmidt. It was from the other Tom. <laughs> no, I understand. But I, and I didn't send you a picture of mine because mine was actually in more pieces than that. So. But, but, but that happens to all those caps because when they finally short, I mean, it, it's an explosive. It's thing. a world-ending phenomenon. And, and as Mike said, yes, yeah, some have oil in them and they kept spurting that because it gets pretty hot and, you know, there's pressure buildup. Couple of questions, or not questions, but a couple of things. First off, this cap is a, that, that's an X cap. It's a, a squared off cap. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can read the writing on it. But uh, number two, um, if you take a scope, you can find the outside foil of a cap by plugging your, your, your uh, uh, leads on the, on the both sides of the cap and then physically touch the outside of the cap. Don't touch the uh, leads, but touch the outside. And once you uh, hit the right spot where, because uh, you'll switch your probes from one side to the other, you'll also notice that where it makes the less amount of noise being coupled from your finger to the cap, you have it right, you have it the right way where your uh, positive bleed is actually going to the foil side of the cap. That's a clever idea. And it worked. Mm -hmm. So, that was another thing I was going to say, and I forgot what it was. Hey Keith, I, uh, I I just happened to notice that when I when I do that test, the fluorescent light over my workbench works as a great RF emitter. So I just hold it up near the fluorescent light, and I can tell. Yeah, that that works too. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's an easy way of telling you know what side of the foils on it. 